BBC Four Collections, specially chosen programmes from the BBC Archive. For this collection, Sir David Attenborough has chosen documentaries from the start of his career. More programmes on this theme and other BBC Four Collections are available on BBC iPlayer. If Africa has a heart, this must be very close to it. For within a few miles of one another, there rise here two of its main arteries. A few miles north, it lies the source of the Congo River, which flows west down to the Atlantic Ocean. And this tiny brook at my feet is the infant Zambezi River. We are planning to follow it along its entire course, sometimes on foot, sometimes in boats, sometimes by car. It's a journey of 2,200 miles. Baboons, the ruffians, the bandits of the African bush. <coughs> Noisy, quarrelsome, mischievous, frightened of nothing except perhaps a lion, they roister through the forest around the source of the Zambezi, as they do across most of Africa below the Sahara. They will eat anything, birds' eggs, fruit, insects, carrion. Sometimes they will even catch and kill a young antelope. They wander in bands up to a hundred strong, ruled despotically by one big, powerful male. When he goes down to drink at the river, everyone else clears out of the way. Within a few miles of its beginning, the young Zambezi swells from a trickling stream into a sizable river, and already it is a focus of animal life. A white-fronted bee-eater, iridescent green with a brilliant gash of scarlet across its throat. The dry season is ending, and the bee-eaters are beginning to prospect for nests. A few of their burrows in the riverbank have survived from last season, and every evening the birds congregate to survey the available accommodation. They seem positively to enjoy the business of burrowing, and if there's not a vacant hole, and they aren't yet sufficiently enthusiastic to begin a completely new one, then they can still luxuriate in a similar thrill by wriggling in the soft, warm sand. But there is still great competition to occupy any available burrow. And since at this stage no one has yet established complete ownership, everyone tries to barge his way into a hole, even if there are three or four others already inside. At this early stage in its career, the Zambezi is largely ignored by roads. Only occasionally does a track endeavour to cross the river, and then, only too often, by the most rickety of bridges. We followed the river as it wound its way westwards, through Zambia, uh, towards the Portuguese territory of Angola. Beneath these blankets lie six young girls.
At their head sits an old woman supervising the ritual, and by her side the sacred moody bush, which has a milky sap and symbolizes womanhood. For the children beneath the blankets have reached a crisis in their lives. They are about to leave childhood and emerge into the adult world. None must move a muscle as they lie half suffocated beneath the blankets under a savage sun, while their elders dance around them. This dance is only the beginning of a long period of initiation, during which the girls will be hidden from the public gaze. Throughout this time, they live in a small shelter on the outskirts of the village, visited only by the old women who instruct them in the skills and duties of adult life. One of the girls is now due to be ceremonially reborn as a woman, and this is also the prelude to her marriage. Behind a screen outside the village, the women prepare her for her wedding. They treat her almost like a doll as they dress her hair in the fashion approved by custom. They wash her body and anoint it with oil and red ochre. This is her wedding day, an occasion for her to wear all her finest, her most dazzling possessions, a muslin petticoat from the nearest village store a circlet of beads with a little charm hanging over the brow. And most precious and highly esteemed of all, the badge of true sophistication, a pair of plastic sunglasses. The child is about to become a woman. At the same time, in the center of the village, her bridegroom-to-be, unattended, is also washing himself behind a flimsy screen that is no more than a symbol of privacy. The women prepare a final meal for the bride of glutinous cassava puddings and chicken boiled with peppers. The first mouthful of chicken she may chew and swallow. But the second must be offered to the spirits of the unborn children of her marriage, and so she will spit it out ceremonially towards the east, where the sun rises. The third must be sent westward to propitiate the ancestors, whose spirits departed at death into the sunset. Even now, she may not be seen by any man, and she comes into the village hidden beneath a sheet and escorted by the women. Beneath the sheet to keep her company is an even younger girl, a bridesmaid.
The moment of rebirth has come. Her father with an axe, her mother with a hoe, to symbolize the work that will now be hers, reveal her to the world. The young bride sits dazed and bewildered. She is a woman and a wife. She is 12. And the wedding guests put gifts of money into the bowl beside her. After the river has swung down south through Angola, it emerges once more into Zambia. And here it has to force its way across the Chavuma Rapids. And below the rapids, we crossed it. The Zambezi here is nearly a quarter of a mile wide. Livingston, the first European to explore most of its course, had hoped that the Zambezi would prove to be a highway for commerce and civilization, leading right to the center of the continent. Even today, optimistic people are still hatching plans to use the river in this way. But its long, placid stretches are interrupted by a series of falls and rapids which no boat can negotiate. And Chavuma is the first. The Zambezi is now 250 miles old. Leaving Angola behind, it glides on southwards through Zambia towards the wide, flat floodplains of Barotsiland. Crowned cranes choose the lonelier stretches of the Barotsi Plain for their dancing grounds. As one arrives, it issues a formal invitation to dance by bobbing its head, uh, an invitation that isn't always accepted. All the crane family seems to be obsessed by a passion for dancing, but none of them more so than the crowned crane. And when a bobbing invitation is accepted, then the ecstasy begins. Sometimes a dancer gets so excited that it will pick up a feather or a piece of straw and jubilantly toss it into the air. But dancing in this fashion does have its hazards. 
particularly if there's a strong wind to catch your broad wings and blow you over. Every morning throughout the year, the flocks of cranes gather to indulge in their dance. They bounce and they flap for an hour or more. And then, as the day wears on, the passion dies, their minds turn to more mundane affairs, and they begin to feed. Their golden coronets glinting in the relentless, scorching sun. The fires that, at the end of the dry season, blaze on the plains can lick through the parched, tinder-dry grass with frightening speed. And if there's a strong wind behind them, they surge forward as fast as a man can run. Lizards and snakes scuttle away ahead of the flames. Insects and small birds take to flight and are swept into the sky by the gigantic updraft. And so, ahead of the advancing line of fire, falcons, hawks and harriers sweep through the smoke, waiting to pounce on the refugees. Although the larger animals can easily escape the flames by cantering gently ahead of them, the fire advances on such a wide frontier that it drives increasingly large herds of game before it. For days, the zebra will move in advance of the blaze until the fire reaches a stream or a stretch of sand or the wind drops. Then the flames die, leaving behind them a blackened, smoking land. Here and there, among the stubble, lie a few corpses of creatures that were scorched or asphyxiated to death. And gathering the corpses come the carrion feeders, the adjutant storks. The Barotsi Plain is the home of the Lozi people, who build their villages on small mounds dotted over the land. They build neatly, each house with a courtyard fenced by a tall wall of reeds. Many of the villages have their own blacksmiths. Though they now use fencing wire, oil drums, and discarded pieces of European machinery as a source of their iron, they still work the metal by traditional methods. And in a forge powered by goatskin bellows and charcoal, the smiths turn out the axes and spears without which any lousy man would feel almost naked. An ivory carver works near the smith, for this indeed is no ordinary village. This is Lea Louis, the capital of Barotsiland. And this man is a member of the entourage of the Litunga, the paramount chief. Everything he makes belongs to the Litunga. Some objects will be part of the royal regalia that may be owned by none but the Litunga himself. And most important of them, the fly whisks, ivory handled and tufted with hair from an eland's tail. 
The Litunga is a demigod. He is so sacred that he must live in seclusion, shut away in his palace behind a series of tall reed fences, each tied with special bindings and topped with wooden spikes that are the prerogative of royalty. Musicians who regularly play in the outer courtyard of the palace are also the king's personal servants. And on the eve of important ceremonials, their xylophones and drums echo across the village for days on end. Few people are privileged enough to be allowed to pass through the outer courtyard and enter the inner enclosure. Here, in a shrine, are kept the trophies of the royal hunts, the backbones and the tails of elephants slaughtered by the Litunga and the royal hunters in times gone by, together with the royal hunting spears. Elephants in Barotsiland, like sturgeon in Britain, are royal game, and none may kill an elephant without the Litunga's permission. Only the privileged may seek an audience with the Litunga, and when a visitor arrives, he must make obeisance in the inner courtyard to show his respect for the God King. Visitors arriving in the capital from outlying parts of the Barotsi Kingdom give an even more elaborate royal salute as they approach the palace. Yo. Yo. The Litunga is about to make one of his rare visits to the village beyond his palace walls. He is on his way to open the courts which rule the land. And like the Queen's opening of Parliament in Westminster, it's an occasion of much ceremonial. The Litunga's grandfather, Luanika I, signed treaties with the government of Queen Victoria, and the Litunga himself has many times left his kingdom and come to Britain to discuss the affairs of his country. And so Western formal dress has now become part of the formalities of this ancient African ritual. As the Litunga leaves the precincts of the palace and emerges into the village, his people welcome him. The paramount chief, the people believe, is descended from God. His full title, Mbumawa Litunga, means literally Lord of the Land. It is he who is the custodian of the Earth's fertility, and in paying homage to him, the Lozi people are paying respect to the land that provides them with their food and their livelihood.
none of the business of dispensing justice or debating decisions, which is the function of the Kuta, the Barotse court, will be carried out today. The Litunga will inaugurate the session, blessing it by his presence, and will listen to music played by the royal musicians. The Barotse kingdom includes three main tribes, and so the Litunga must hear music that belongs to each of them, so acknowledging symbolically the union of the three people in one nation. And while he listens, his senior ministers confer with him. After the Lutunga has left, the day-to-day -day business of the courts may begin. Here, lozy men will come and present their grievances and their troubles to a court of elders, who in the past were chiefs and held their positions by virtue of their ancestry, but who today are elected by tribal vote. Many of the disputes to be settled will concern the Lowe's main source of wealth, cattle. Handsome, long-horned beasts that during the dry season graze over the wide Barotse plains. Every evening they are tethered to stakes in one particular place so that their droppings will be concentrated on one patch which later will be used for a fertile garden. The Zambezi, which flows down the centre of the kingdom of Barotsiland, also gives much of its wealth to the people on its banks, for it is rich in fish. And along the river's length stand small encampments where fishermen smoke their catch before trading it right through the kingdom. In the far south of the Barotse Plain, the Zambezi has to cross the rocky barrier of the Sioma Falls. When the rainy season comes, the Zambezi swells and is so impeded by these falls that it dams up behind them and spills over its banks, so that the huge plain becomes one vast, shallow lake, and the lands on which the cattle once grazed become the domain of water birds. These are skimmers, strange birds which have a greatly elongated lower beak, which they dip into the water as they skim over the surface in order to catch little fish and insects. Elegant and beautiful in flight, when they settle, their extraordinary bills give them a grotesque look. Cormorants arrive to guzzle on the fish that now swarm in the shallow waters. And above the lagoons hover the little pied kingfishers. They hang in the air, their beaks poised like daggers, until they spot a silvery glint in the water that signals a meal. Among the many birds assembling on the flooded plain come flocks of open-bill storks, 
They get their name from the fact that they can't fully close their beaks. There's a gap halfway down. The delicacy which lures them here are the snails, which swarm in the reeds. Some naturalists have suggested that the birds use the gap in their bills as a sort of nutcracker when tackling a snail. Now we had a chance of finding out if this was true. It isn't. The open bill does the trick, working delicately with only the tip of its beak. Using it, in fact, uh, not like a nutcracker, but more like a pair of forceps. As the floods rise, the people are compelled to move from their villages. And with them, they must take their cattle. Cattle are unwilling swimmers. As long as the bank they've just left is near, they will do their best to return to it, rather than head out into open water. They circle and eddy until one of them assumes the duties of leader and swims out boldly. When at last that happens, most of the herd will follow. <laughs> But even now, some of these stragglers try to swim back and have to be headed off. Soon the waters are lapping around Lea Louis, the capital itself. The people must move out to the hills on either side of the plain, and the departure of the Litunga for his wet season capital is the occasion for the greatest festival in the whole of Barotsiland. On the morning of his departure, the entire domestic possessions of the royal court are brought down to the water's edge. The Litunga will travel in the royal barge, the Nalikwanda. On board it goes the palace safe. The noblemen, the Ndunas, who will paddle the barge, dress themselves with kilts of skins. On their heads, they must wear pieces of a lion's mane. The national drums must also be put aboard, for they will be played throughout the voyage. The Litunga is escorted to his barge by his advisers and government officials.
And so the entire fleet sets off. Behind the Naliquanda come baggage barges and the personal barges belonging to the Queen and various important princes. But none must get ahead of the Naliquanda. the fleet arrives at Limalunga, the capital in the hills, and dry land. The Litunga, the lord of the land, having changed into his most resplendent uniform on the voyage, leaves for his wet season palace, where he will remain until the waters fall. Now, squadrons of pelican circle the sky above the floods and wheel down to fish in the lagoons. The river has always dominated the life of the Lozi. Every year, it brings down rich, fertile mud from the hills around its source and spreads it over the plain. Every year, the people must take refuge for six months in the hills, while the Zambezi transforms their fields and pastures into a lake 100 miles long and 20 miles wide. Only when the river retreats between its banks and the water empties from the plain can the Lozi return to their homes and reclaim the land from the lily trotters and the cranes. For in truth, it is not the Litunga who is lord of the land, but the Zambezi. <laughs> <laughs> 